that. So I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers for inviting me to contribute to this very important series of lectures. And I belong to a generation of archaeologists which, for several reasons, is not very familiar with the archaeology of Iran, which is an archaeologically extremely rich country that I have often regretted not to have been able to visit and whose contacts with Mesopotamia were so deep in the age of the first urban civilization, so the fourth and third millennium BC. So more recently, since I started working in Georgia, I often reflected on what I sometimes called the, the Northern Corridor. So a network of interrelations, which since at least the early fourth millennium BC, connects uh, with each other the Northern mountainous regions of the Near East, and along which mate raw materials, people, artifacts, technologies, ideas, cultural practices have been traveling at different times. So among the nearest neighbors of the Southern Caucasus, which were in various ways part of this network, Northwestern Iraq certainly deserves special attention, although its importance has sometimes been underestimated. In fact, the contacts between the western flanks of the Zagros Mountains, the Urmia Lake region, and the southeast section of the Southern Caucasus, so the mountainous area of the Nexar Caucasus, Nakhchivan region, Armenia, western Azerbaijan, and also with the plains of Azerbaijan, were well established since the late Neolithic and continued after the third millennium, uh, continued throughout the Chalcolithic and even and after the third millennium BC, for a long time, for instance, they were very strong in the late Bronze and Iron Age as well. So therefore, the expansion of the Kuraraxas culture into Western Iran follows already well-known to routes and communication networks, corridors. Uh, so, but I'm not, uh, not going to focus on these issues, we, which has been already dealt with by uh, some colleagues in this seminar series. Uh, in fact, the region of Eastern Georgia, where I've been working since 2009 in the middle Kura Basin, in the framework of the Georgian-Italian Shidakarte Archaeological Project, uh, GSCAP project, of Kafoska University in collaboration with the Georgian National Museum um, did not reveal any new evidence permitting the, pertaining to direct connections with this area. Um, and as already pointed out by the pioneering research of Tony Sagona in the 80s, the Shidakatli variant of the Kuraraxas culture, here is underlined in blue, with the blue line, is characterized by strong regional uh, features in material culture, as well as in architecture and funerary customs, which continue throughout the period. And the reason the region belongs to the core area of the culture, where its development can be followed over the whole, the full length of the period. So the, tra uh, the traditional division of the period into three phases, Kural Access 1, 2, and 3, in my opinion, fit, better fits the Shidakatli ceramic development than the bipartite one presently preferred by most scholars, which is maybe more appropriate for Armenia, for instance. Briefly, uh, so I will use this tripartite one. Briefly, phase one dated from 3500 to about 3200, 100 BC, about, is characterized mainly by monochrome wear. So not um, red, black varnished wear. Uh, phase two dated from this date to about 2800 by the prevalence of red, black varnished wear. And phase three, after 2800 to about 2800, 600 
probably 500 BC, by the spreading of black burnished ware conti and continuing red black burnished ware. And other features like uh, um, incised and relief decoration, morphological details uh, such as raised base, uh, doubly carinated profiles, uh, slightly convex shoulders, and so on. So in architecture, there is a very vague and not a completely coherent development from simple dwellings of rounded shape to the typical uh, wattle and dub huts of rectangular shape with rounded corners provided with a rectangular front annex. Uh, fixed on the uh, as for earth fixed uh, earths develop from earlier round shaped to the typical uh, polylobate ones graves are mostly either simple rectangular pits or rectangular pits lined with cobblestones. So not cyst graves, because cyst graves have slabs of, of, uh, of stone. These are cobbles. Uh, so the graves are often covered with a small irregular assemblage of stones, but they are not kurgans. Uh, Kurgans are extremely rare, only one real attested case in the province and one or two doubtful ones. Both individual and collective graves are present and bar burial goods are modest and very standardized. Uh, so this is one um, collection of uh, burial goods, uh, not one grave. So they consist of few pottery vessels, personal ornaments in metals and stone, all types which find numerous parallels over the whole distribution area of the Kuran Axis culture. So to sum up, all the typically, typical easily recognizable features of the Kuran Axis package are accompanied in Shidakartli by strong regional features, which do not suggest um, special connections or intensive movement, movements to multiple areas. So there were certainly movements, but not so easy detectable. Obsidian is imported in the region, but exclusively from its nearest source, the Cicchiani Vulcano near Lake Paravani in southern Georgia. Pottery, as far as, as it was analyzed, is all of local origin, made with local clays and few local temporary materials. If anything, the region shows some special connections with the Cremo, Cremo particularly strong connections with the Cremo Cartley region of southern Georgia, beyond this with Armenia and eastern Turkey, that is in southern direction. Interesting, some some relations can be perceived with the Turkish Upper Euphrates, Malatya Elazi region. For instance, some of the artifacts found in the well-known royal tomb of period 6B1 at Aslantepe exhibit distinctly Shidakartlian features. Uh, to start with the, these metal diadems with repousse decoration, there are three of them from Shidakartli and three from the royal grave. Uh, to the right are other types which are common, but they are common to other regions of the Kural Axis as well, like the double volute pins. Um, so, or some another common feature with the upper Euphrates, some water and dub huts from the Keban Dam region, North Shuntepe, are very similar in plan. To the, to, one, uh, to the ones from Shitakaltri, and are also provided with these typical polylobate earths. So it remains to be verified and further inquired whether this may uh, highlight a distinct ripple from Shitakaltri to the upper Euphrates in the overall stream, to say it with this nice image by Mitchell Rotman, of migrations which is considered to have contributed to the general phenomenon of the Kural Axis suspension. So be that as it may, the pattern of occupation of the Shidakata region during the Kural Axis period, this is a possible connection and already highlighted by Mitchell. 
so but the pattern of occupation of the Shidakarli region during the Kurarakses period by itself does not suggest a particularly mobile society, especially in comparison with the previous late Calcolithic, which is very poorly attested in this region. So it suggests not an intensive, uh, uh, not an intensive occupation. And with the following early Kurgan period, where occupation is much more evanescent and suggests a mobile, in fact, a more mobile society. So settlements are, in fact, rather numerous, though in general small. They concentrate in the fertile plain of the Kura, where the largest and more stable ones are located. And on the lower course of its tributaries. So on the routes that lead from the Kura Valley into the hilly region, flanking these on both sides, especially on the northern one, but this may be uh, ch the chances of, um, of a discovery. More flimsy settlements, possibly seasonal campsites, uh, suggesting the practice of short distance transhumance, have been reported at higher altitude, but none has been uh, yet investigated in detail. Some of them are located in this northern area, which is now the, the, um, uh, the secessionist province, uh, so it cannot be, uh, they cannot be investigated presently. So a recurrent element. This is the settlements along the Kura. So a recurrent element is the associated association of a settlement with an adjacent, uh, sorry, no. Uh, along the main river, settlements are located in dominant positions in the valley at a short distance from and often visible from each other. So they are at five or six kilometers apart and they are visible from each other. A recurrent element is the association of a settlement with an adjacent cemetery. So this is the case at Quaskela Cemetery to Le Piascaro, Kizanantora Cemetery Rugnisi, Aradeti Sorgora Cemetery Doglauri, and Nazargora, where the cemetery has the same name as the settlement. So this is I think also a hint to a rather stable occupation. Settlements are mainly located on small natural mounds. The more stable ones can have a succession of a coral access levels of several meters. So they are somehow similar to what is attested, for instance, in the Nachivan region of Azerbaijan with sites like Kultepe uh, on a less scale. So the two sites investigated by the GISCAP project between 2009 and 2017, Aradeti Sorgora Doglauri and Nazargora, eh, well illustrate the curar access occupation of the Shitakartli area. Both of them consist of a settlement and an adjacent cemetery, or we from which a significant sample of curar access graves eh, were was excavated by Georgian archaeologists, Yulonga Goshidze and respectively Alexander Ramishvili, and they will be jointly published by our expedition. They are 79 graves for, from uh, Doglauri and 26 from, uh, from Nazargora. So a total of about 40 C14 dates. This is the Yes, the, the settlements, a total of about C14 dates, 40 C14 dates, allows to uh, date the occupation of the sites to around 3,100 to, uh, to 2,800 or a bit later BC, that is mainly to phase Kurar Access 2 and transition to phase Kurar Access 3, with Nazargora beginning a bit earlier and ending earlier, so with a shorter sequence than Aradetis, which has a longer sequence. Uh, so neither the early nor the latest Kurar Access period are attested uh, so far at these sites, but they are present in at other sites of the region. So the Aradetis Orgora complex lies in a dominant position on the Kura River Valley and is an important regional center occupied from the Kura access to the early medieval period. Only the main mound, which is what you see on the right, was occupied in the Kura access period. Uh, there we 
excavated a stratigraphical trench on one side of the mound in field B, uh, where we, found, we unearthed uh, a tightly packed four meter high sequence of coral access levels with six main occupational phase levels, phases. So they, they yielded remains of buildings of different types and in different building techniques. From phase six, the first built on, on the virgin soil came a typical water and daub hut of rounded shapes equipped with a polylobate earth. Phase four yielded the most important discovery on which I will come back later also, what we interpreted as a small village shrine. So that was of rectangular shape with rounded corners had a carefully plastered floor with traces of a clay earth here, and the wall was built of clay. Uh, so on the floor lay a smashed Kuraraxis jar and two almost complete uh, unique zoomorphic vessels, probably in the shape of water birds, one of them with traces of painted decoration. You can see it on the, in, on the uh, photo on the, on the left and, the, and on the drawing. So palynological analysis of their content by Elisa Kvavadze of the Georgian National Museum strongly suggested that the, the zoomorphic vessels contained wine, we suppose used for ritual purposes, because of the special shape of the vessels and the context. Uh, uh, so the, the spe palynological spectrum of the vessels content was identical to that of historical and modern home weighed wine, um, whereas the jar apparently contained cereals. From phase three came the heavily burnt remains of structures with rectilineal water and out walls, which have been destroyed by a fire. From phase two, this is an interesting detail, there were two small round-shaped huts equipped with benches and fixed earth, uh, the first of which cut the second one. Interesting detail is this with this line of larger stone slabs, which was standing in vertical position against the outer face of the wall of the first uh, building. A detail which, to the best of our knowledge, was unparalleled uh, in Kuraraktas architecture in Shidakatli and also elsewhere. So this was the first, the first site. Second site is Kashuri Nazargora, which is a small mound joined by a flat settled area, which lies on a secondary route leading in northern direction from the Kura Valley to the mountains in an area occupied by smooth hills and valleys. The distance from the Kura River is only seven kilometers, but the landscape is a bit different. So in the 31st, 30th century BC, it was the seat of a short-lived Kuraraxis village, only a few decades earlier and partially contemporary with Aradetis Orgora. The cooler access level was only 50 centimeters thick, so more ephemeral than Aradetis, and partially uh, and, uh, dis uh, and very dis disturbed by later pits and foundations, a and also by pervasive bioperturbance. The excavated area gives a, a sequence of external surfaces with remains of rather ephemeral structures into building phases, but very near to each other. Some round shaped huts in cob blocks or mud bricks like this one. Some and some water and dub huts or palisades better. And a large number of both internal and open air firing installations of different types. So from the typical cooler access polylobate ones to rounded and semicircular ones to curved or rectilinear or shaped ones. Uh, soil micromorphology analysis uh, of the prepared surfaces confirmed that their use in cereal processing activities and only occasionally in animal husbandry. So that there were a, a sequence of 
often remade um, uh, floors, let's say, uh, with where uh, activities with ser processing cereals took place. So instead of the small excavated surfaces and of the bad preservation of the archaeological remains, the two sites reveal, revealed an unsuspected vari variety in Kurarax's architectural plans, building techniques and installations, even in the same or in very nearby sites and over a short period of time, an issue on which we are presently elaborating, but that is certainly worth considering for other regions as well. Now, that recent, recent well-documented excavations are multiplying all over the Curaraxis distribution area. So the general pattern, but the uh, uh, very high individual variation. The comparative analysis of the two cemeteries allows some interesting observations about Curaraxis funerary ca customs in the area. Both are, as we said, located close to the settlement in areas which were intensively used as burial places in later periods, especially in the late Bronze Iron Age as well. On the right, you have the Curaraxis graves are in blue, uh, late Bronze Iron Age graves are in red in Doglauri Cemetery. So in the Curaraxis period, they were in use for relatively short period, two or three centuries, Doglauri maybe more, a bit more, contemporary with the settlement layers, as proved by the analysis of material culture, which is identical in settlement and lay in the cemetery, and confirmed for Doglauri by some for, for C14 dates as well. So Nazargora is only slightly earlier than Doglauri. Grave types are very similar as well, almost identical uh, in position of a skeleton, for instance. Pit graves and pit graves lined with cobblestones, often covered by a heap of cobblestones, are the only attested type of grave. The only significant difference, still to be explained, is in the very different proportion of individual versus collective graves with remains of up to six different individuals. So the individual graves are virtually exclusive in Nazargora. There is only one case of a more collective, but it's very special uh, at Nazargora. Whereas at the Blauri, they are, the collective graves are uh, more than two thirds, about two, for between two th one, third, one third and half. Uh, so collective graves are larger in average and slightly richer than individual ones, but they contain more corpses. They contain the at least partially articulated skeleton of the last buried individual and commingled remains of previous depositions of individuals of different sex and age, uh, sometimes only part of them. We tentatively interpret them as family graves, uh, and we are trying to understand by various um, uh, analysis, uh, how long they were in use, and to better define the relations, family relations, or some other type of relation between the different deceased. So the, there is this difference in uh, uh, individual versus collective grades, but burial goods, on the contrary, are quite similar in the two cemeteries, we could say almost identical, if not for the fact that the assemblage from the Glauri is a bit richer, both in number and in variety of items. The same is valid for raw material types. For instance, although it was not yet been possible to analyze the metals from the Glauri materials, but it is clear already from the from visual uh, analysis that the, um, there are different copper alloys as well as silver. Whereas in Nazargora, we have apparently only a semical copper. This larger variety may depend on different factors. The larger number of, of graves excavated at Doglauri, 79 versus 26, 
or the slightly later grave of Doglauri, or the central role of uh, the corresponding site, whose inhabitants might have had access to more wealth and resources than those of the Nazargora village. Uh, or also the higher number of collected graves attested at the Plauri because uh, collected graves are richer in average. Or the combination of some of these factors. Uh, so in the burial goods, pottery vessels, which are generally placed in front or around the skull, may have contained the food offers. We have one evidence um, where we could make palynological analysis of the vessels from this grave. And it turned out that they must have contained some sort of cereal mush or porridge or something like that, which had been cooked on an open fire. Uh, while other items, uh, most of which, as far as we could see from photos, excavation photos, were found directly on the body, were probably personal belongings of the deceased and not offers. So the comparative study of ECOFATS from the two settlements and cemeteries is still ongoing, as well as a number of multidisciplinary analyses, whose combination will, we hope in the end, provide information about the subsistence economy of the local Kural access population and its relation with the ter territory. Preliminary results, however, suggest that the communities residing in the Kura River Valley practiced an integrated agro-pastoral economy um, with a good component of animal husbandry, but based on the exploitation of the fertile plain and including such specialized activities as viticulture. This was widespread and was favored by the slightly milder, cli milder climate compared to present day conditions. So all this also seem, seems to imply a, a, a substantial degree of sedentarity. There are up till now, no marked indications of seasonality in occupation, although short system mobility of a short distance mobility of a component of the population connected with seasonal transhumance is likely. If anything, our evidence suggests that the valley for, was probably periodically visited by mobile peoples from the neighboring mountains which were bringing, for instance, products from the mountains and mineral oils and so on, rather than being itself the origin of mobile groups. Uh, so after illustrating the evidence from, uh, from Shidakatli, I would now turn to the more general question of the current access phenomenon. Instead of discussing the question of its spreading in terms of migration, diasporas, and so on, as most scholars have done until now, uh, which is a very interesting issue, but an issue on which, as I explained before, uh, our research in Shidakati has no new information to provide. So rather than discussing this, I would like to offer some reflections about, about the most impression, impressing features of this cultural complex, namely, on the one hand, its remarkably wide distribution, its very long persistence over up to 1,000 years, and conservatism. And on the other hand, um, on the peculiar mixture of unity and variety or diversity, which characterizes it, uh, of all of which the Shidakatli region represents a good example. So, Kura access pottery production, with all of its regional viability, which could be expressed by the now less used general term of early Transcaucasian ware versus their regional variants, is only one example of this. In fact, the Kural access culture is characterized by a package of uh, immediately recognizable elements which occur throughout its distribution area and show remarkable conservatism. So carinated vessels with lugs in dark, often but not exclusively red and black colors, 
a profusion of fixed and mobile fireplaces, earth and, and irons, often with anthropomorphic zoomorphic decoration, a whole range of metal objects, weapons and ornaments, and objects connected with metallurgy like uh, crucible mounts. Similar apparent contradiction between overall similarity and persistence and local, sometimes even individual variability, can be observed in other fields, such as architecture, where circular and rectangular plans, stone, uh, mud, and water and dub architecture coexist without any evident or co co coherent spatial chronological pattern. Although everywhere we do find villages of simple, often rather ephemeral, monocellular or bicellular buildings, uh, or same same uh, coexistence we find in funerary customs where we have an astonishing variety of grey types, pits, cysts, kurgans, and types of inhumations, individual, collective, which coexist with more modest and very stereotyped, stereotyped in terms of category of objects, funerary sets. So this is the Shida Kartlian one, but if you change the pottery types with types typical of our other regions, the, the set is more or less the same. So the main distinctive feature of the coral access groups, if compared with previous and surrounding cultures, is uh, apparently the rather simple lifestyle and the egalitarian social organization. There is a lack of added evidence signs of status, for instance, in burial goods, or a lack of a clear settlement hierarchy, uh, uh, with some possible exceptions in the latest part in Armenia and in some other areas. <laughs> A lack of architectural specialization, so there are no monumental public buildings or clearly workshop areas and so on. So this suggests that the Kurar access community were an egalitarian society where the individual household was the center of most economic and cultic activities and hierarchy and especially central control, I would say, were quite weak if present at all. So why was the culto so successful? Why did it spread over such wide area and lasted so long in spite of its conservatism and simple organization? I think we could look for the answer in the general framework of the later fourth and early third millennium BC development in the Near East and in the Northern Caucasus as well. That is by using a systemic approach looking from on a wider area uh, and and that I think that in fact that the Kurar access culture is best defined by a series of oppositions with the previous and surrounding cultures. Some of these issues have in fact been anticipated uh, in the discussion of uh, Mehmet Shikli's lecture last week and they have in fact uh, appeared in scholarly discussions in the last few years, by uh, the, some of them have been discussed by Toby Wilkinson, Giulio Palumbi, Marcella Frangipane, um, Tony Sagona, uh, Adam Smith, and so on. So I owe some of these ideas to all of these scholars. But I would like to briefly summarize them here. So it is well known even in popular literature, that the fourth millennium BC is marked by very deep transformations in Mesopotamia. So it is the time of the so-called urban revolution, according to the old child definition, with Uruk in southern Mesopotamia exemplifying the uh, ideal first city, let's say, and the first state organization. And also fourth millennium is characterized by the southern Uruk culture spreading in the second half of the millennium to northern Mesopotamia neighboring areas, so-called Uruk expansion or colonization. Uh, influences from the southern Uruk culture even reached beyond the Taurus range, for instance, at the site of Aslantepe, period 6a. 
so less familiar to the wider audience, but well known about among Near Eastern archaeologists, at least for 40 years by now, is the fact that the process of urbanization was well on its way already in the first half of the fourth millennium, even a bit earlier. And even more important, it fully involved in this earlier phase, Northern Mesopotamia with centers like Nineveh, Tel Brak, this is Tel Brak, uh, Tel Amukar, and Aslantepe in period six, where we have uh, temples, uh, ceilings, and so on, uh, as well as, uh, on the other hand, uh, also uh, Susa in Western Iran, uh, for, for instance. Uh, a more recent discovery, although even, uh, even now somewhat 20 years old, is that deep connections existed in this period, so the earlier half of the, first mil of the fourth millennium BC, and earlier still, between Upper Mesopotamia and the Southern Caucasus, as proved by the distribution of the tradition of vegetal tempered pottery, so-called chaff-faced ware of uh, Amukhef type uh, in its many variants and in the Southern Caucasus with the Leila Tepe uh, culture. Um, so uh, about at the same time, so about 20 years ago, Scholars fully realized that equally revolutionary change that happened in the course of the fourth millennium BC, even farther north in the northern Caucasus, as C14 calibrated dates firmly fixed the microbe culture to the mid fourth millennium BC or even a bit earlier. It had already been supposed but not clearly proved. So compared with the Uruk culture, the microbe culture shows very different but equally important elements of complexity and social inequality. We have monumental funerary barrows, kurgans, here the most famous one, consisting, uh, uh, containing accumulation of valuable objects in precious metals and exotic goods. In particular, a level of unprecedented technical proficiency is found in these objects in the fields of metallurgy. It is thus clear that in the whole area between southern Mesopotamia and the northern Caucasus, as well as even farther away, because a similar phenomena we have in Iran, in Egypt as well at the same time, new forms of social organization and leadership, control of labor, good products were quickly developing, but in different ways. Um, in particular, so there were emerging elites expressing their power in different ways. Uh, so uh, some of these emerging elites in particular, uh, so the, the, there was an extraordinary flourishing of creativity as well in technology and arts, and also in international interconnections. In particular, some of these emerging elites shared a common taste for the same precious exotic materials. Here are some examples from uh, elite graves of the fourth millennium BC. They all have uh, gold, lapis lazuli, and so on. And even for some elements, this came out in the discussion last week also, of what we call, may call an iconography of power. So symbols like uh, bulls and uh, lions for, um, for let's say, uh, power, but even uh, more uh, specific symbols like rosettes, they circulate over a very wide area. Now, how these, uh, we could call this an iconography of power, so how this iconographic repertoire originated and spread it may be debated. So we could think of diffusion or convergency, of, um, but it certainly suggests a shared symbolism and communication at least. So to come back to our uh, cooler access, this is the international situation around 3,500 when the Kurar axis first appears in the Southern Caucasus. 
the cradle of the culture lies just midway between the southern Uruk, which is expanding towards northern Mesopotamia, and the northern Maikop culture. Uh, so the cradle lies with, within the vast area occupied by the uh, chaffaced ware tradition, but probably also by a mosaic of different, less visible local traditions out of which probably the Kuraraxes uh, uh, culture was formed. From the beginning, the Kuraraxes culture appears completely alien to the profound innovations that we have just seen. Even more surprising, at first sight at least, it does not seem to take part to the widespread circulation of exotic goods like lapis lazuli and, uh, and iconographies, many of which connected to the exhibition of the new power, which was one of the characteristic features of the surrounding or previous cultures. So this is the situation around 3500 BC. This is a situation a few centuries after this. Uh, so the Kuraraxes culture is firmly attested in the Southern Caucasus and confronts the Northern expansion of the Southern Uruk culture in a sort of cultural border, as for instance, in the, the Anatolian Upper Euphrates as exemplified by the sites of Asantepe in period 6a, where there are strong Southern Uruk influences. However, a few centuries after, this is the situation around 2800, after the collapse of the Uruk culture in northern Mesopotamia. The Kuraraxes culture has expanded over a wide area all around the North Mesopotamian plain, but without entering the plain, until reaching Palestine and Western Iran. At Aslantepe, for instance, the Mesopotamian influenced palace of period 6a is substituted by the Kuraraxes village of period 6b in a complex development, which I will skip the details of because it, has, it is well known. So it is difficult to, to escape the conclusion that the expansion of the Kuraraxes culture is directly connected with the, the vacuum caused, caused by the crisis of the first uh, urbanization and in some way by some sort of reaction to these mod new models of socio-political organization, especially the southern one, and more in general, the fourth millennium trend towards social hierarchization and inequality. So I try to develop this line of thought uh, a bit further by examining some of the characteristic features of the Kuraraxis culture in comparison with the Uruguayan. For instance, we can examine pottery, where we presently have a good number of archaeometric and technological studies. Um, raw materials, the Kuraraxis pottery are always local with mineral inclusions of various types. Often this seems to be a, let's say, typical feature, they include grog, which is not tested in other cultures, so very little. More interesting is the co that, contrary to the Uruk productions, there are no clearly differentiated fabrics. So in other words, the same fabric is used for all types of vessels. Pottery is always handmade, while Uruk pottery is made or finished in a variety and combination of different uh, uh, techniques, hand, wheel, mold, and so on. Kuraraxis pottery is normally a domestic production of individual households. Uruk pottery is specialized in some cases can be defined as mass production. So as a consequence, Kuraraxis vessels are very regular. Uruk ones are very standardized. On the other hand, Kural access potters invest more time on the surface of the vessel by burnishing, which is a time-consuming task, sometimes preceded by applying a slip, and by applying some decoration in the lace late part of the Kural access period at least, which has evident symbolic meaning, uh, while Uruk pots are generally undecorated and the surface is normally only smoothed. 
surface colors are also contrasting. Uruk pottery is generally oxidized and of lighter colors. Kuraraxa's pottery loves dark tunes, black in particular, often associated with red to create the typical bichromy. Possibly these preferences originated by experimenting with transformation induced by fire, something which I think may be connected with the practice of metallurgy, control of oven conditions, temperature, or possibly a desire of imitating metal vessels. So dark tunes might, might imitate silver, reddish, some copper alloys, or even gold. So to sum up, Uruk pottery is mainly functional artifact whose production satisfies efficiency criteria, uh, but it doesn't seem to be imbued with evident symbolic values, at least not of the same time as, as this type as curar access. Curar access pottery has a strong visual appeal and is loaded with symbolic cultural values. Also, if we look at vessels morphology, some aspect of it may signal particular cooking habits, like the presence of leads may suggest use of stews or mushes or similar food, which also suggests a different cultural identity. Besides this, the whole approach, I would say, of Kurar Axis and Duru people to morphology is opposite. So Ukru pottery shows a strong functional specialization. Let's say every vessel seems designed for a specific function. While one could say by exaggerating a bit that Kurar Axis culture has only one basic shape. So a wide mouthed vessel, these are examples from Shida Kartli, which is repeated in different sizes and deformed by making it squatter or more elongated, and thus this rises to four or five main functional types, which are repeated all over again with by adding lags, one or two lags, and with little variation, let's say. Uh, so another example we could examine more quickly what we can infer about cult. Here we have a clear opposition between plural access domestic cults, Uruk institutional, institutionalized cults, Kurar access no special plans, just some possible isolated monuments like obelisks. On the other end, on the other side, the public monumental architecture and e temples, but even more ceremonial complexes. Then we have no full-time cult uh, specialist and dedicated personnel. Uh, which possible gods? Well, on one side, only vaguely anthropomorphic entities as appear on the vessels or on the on the um, earth and the irons. On the other side, the developing pantheon of anthropomorphic gods. Finally, on one side, small scale, scale ceremonies in small village shrines or houses and public ceremonies like as Aslantepe or Uruk or like uh, shown in, in the Uruk ve ve vessel, uh, public ceremonies with uh, food distributions and uh, processions and so on. So one example of the really um, type of ceremony which may have taken places within the Kural Access uh, um, communities can be managed on the basis of this recent uh, discovery by the GSCAP project at Aradetis, which I mentioned before. So the building of, of which, unfortunately, we could excavate only a very small part is only slightly larger, but similar in plan to the surrounding um, huts of the Kural Access villages. It also contains a fireplace as the, uh, similar to the houses. And inside it, we found these two vessels in the shape of water birds. Uh, so pollen analysis, these are vessels, showed that the vessels contained 
not only pollen of Vitis vinifera, but pollen of other plants, hazelnuts, infesting weeds, which usually grow beside vineyards. And in addition, remains of air of Drosophila, which is the fruit fly, which typically fries around grapes and um, swarm in large numbers during fermentation and easily fall into the large vessels where wine is placed. So this composition of micro pollen and palinomorph is the same which is found in modern vessels where home produced wine in, Ge in Georgia is stored and uh, other archaeological uh, wine container. So so we can thus imagine that this shrine was the seat of ceremonies where wine was libated or commonly consumed by the, some members of the Aradetis Orgora village. So the Kuraraxa sculpture can thus be set at the beginning of the long South Caucasian, specifically Georgian tradition of the ritual use of wine, may, continuing until today, making use of uh, uh, animal-shaped containers. So if we go to funerary rare customs, we have no direct comparison. We can, we cannot make uh, any direct comparison with the Uruk culture as the funerary customs of the latter are very poorly known. But we can compare the Kuraraxas customs with those of the North Caucasian Maikop culture or in the Southern Caucasus with those of the contemporary Leila Tepe culture for the fourth millennium, or with those of the later early Kurgan cultures, which uh, come after the, Uruk, the, the Kuraraxas in the middle, uh, late third millennium BC. So all these are characterized by the northern tradition of barrow graves, which is quite unusual in the ancient Near East. I'm not tackling the, the complex question of the origin of Kurgans and its development and reasons of spreading in the southern Caucasus. I want to emphasize that all these examples of Kurgan fourth and late third millennium represent elite graves which contain rare and valuable objects and exotic goods and wagons and so on. Purgans, as I said, are not alien to the Kuraraxas tradition and in some areas in Azerbaijan, for instance, they are relatively common, but the, these uh, but uh, Kuraraxas funerary monuments are much more diversified. But what is important here is that Kuraraxas kurgans are collective graves which contain the remain of a large number of individuals and do not any exhibit any clear feature of elitarian graves because their burial goods are modest and absolutely similar, I would say, to those of the remaining Kuraraxas graves. They also don't contain exotic material and precious objects, which may play the role of evident status symbols. Typically, uh, the Kuraraxas burial goods are a few vessels, a few metal or stone ornaments, and uh, which are not offers, but personal ornaments, as I proved as I showed in the case of the Glauri. Um, so in particular, objects of metal, so copper alloys in particular, I think cannot be considered the status symbols because they are relatively common in Kuraraxas graves. And they are, so to say, local products of an area where metallurgy was rather widespread and practiced. Uh, on the contrary, it is very significant that gold, which was known and extracted by the Kuraraxas people, as in the case of the that crazy mine um, does not feature prominently and is in fact almost absent. I think there is only one, uh, one object in all the hundreds of Kuraraxas graves found. Uh, so it's almost absent in Kuraraxas graves. These metal ornaments uh, in uh, copper alloys belong to very distinctive types. So double volute pins, spiral bracelets, drop-shaped pendants, hair rings, diadems. Uh, they tend to occur throughout the culture distribution area, maybe 
di uh, maybe diadems are a bit uh, uh, would deserve some uh, special um, some special uh, discussion, but the rest tend to occur throughout the cultural distribution area, and they rather seem to represent the powerful markers of cultural identity, similar to these in pottery, to the uh, uh, to pottery, decorated the fireplace and the irons, which I mentioned before. So I interpret them as part of a sort of cultural access fashion which we have tried to recreate for uh, didactical pro uh, purposes. Uh, please don't take this too seriously. Uh, so this was a workshop we did for children, but uh, the pictures on the right are original pieces from the Glauri worn by a member of our team. So similar reasoning could be done for pot shapes, presence of which the presence of leads, fireplaces, uh, special sort of cereals, which several scholars have, have recently argued that may mark specific cura access food habits. So we have a cura access fashion and also a cura access cuisine, let's say. So to conclude, it's difficult to escape the impression that the secret for the success and longevity of this culture lies in its strong cultural identity, where, uh, where status and social hierarchy, if existing at all, I think there were cultural access leaders, but uh, so the, the, their, their status was purposely de-emphasized to advantage of identity markers, which create a strong horizontal ties within each and between different groups belonging to the same culture. Part of this cultural identity, I think, is the refusal of imported materials, objects, and iconographies, in spite of the fact that Kurar Access Group were clearly in contact with the surrounding populations. They settled among them sometimes. And, for instance, were certainly part of the interregional network for the exchange of metal ores and metals. It is also difficult to escape the impression that many elements of this Kurar Access identity were modeled in contrast with those of the Uruk and also the Maikop cultures, and especially of the model of hierarchical society that they conveyed, in particular against the model of a hierarchical urban society conveyed by the Uruk culture. This model, which originated in Mesopotamia in the fourth millennium BC, will later expand well beyond its core area and become typical of the Near Eastern uh, Bronze Age society. But it was especially suitable to the large Mesopotamian alluvium, where the presence of vast plains favored the agglomeration of large quantity of people into urban centers. And it was difficult to export in the rough and diverse, diversified environment of the highlands, mountains and plateaus, which extended to the north and east. So in this sense, this sort of autarchic egalitarian model represented by the Kural Access culture was much more easy to adapt to the highland environment and also to the importance of the pastoral component of his economy. And this is probably another reason of its enduring success. Uh, it is not a chance, in fact, that the expansion of the Kural Access culture completely skips the Mesopotamian alluvium and nearly coincides with the arc of islands including the Palestinian hills, which surrounds it. So, in, uh, however, in the course of time, the urban model turned out to be more successful. And uh, I think that the, the renewed expansion of the mid third millennium Mesopotamian uh, urbanization uh, is, is in fact connected with the end of the Kural Access phenomenon and its transformation in the core area, in, it, in the same co core area, into something different that is the um, early, Kurgan, uh, early Kurgan cultures. So that's all, and I'm sorry if uh, it was too long. And uh, thank you very much for your for your attention.